深入中国三十年，向世界讲述真实的当代中国。The best to tell China stories is to be honest and direct and completely open about what is happening to the best of your ability. I mean, that's what I've always tried to do. 剖析中国之治。The largest population on earth undergoing the greatest transformation in history, and that has been led by the Communist Party of China. 风云对话专访中国问题专家、中国改革友谊奖章获得者罗伯特·库恩在中国共产党第二十次全国代表大会开幕式上，习近平总书记代表第十九届中央委员会向党的二十大做报告。习近平说：“十年来，我们经历了对党和人民事业具有重大现实意义和深远历史意义的三件大事：一是迎来中国共产党成立一百周年；二是中国特色社会主义进入新时代。”三是完成脱贫攻坚、全面建成小康社会的历史任务，实现第一个百年奋斗目标。其中，脱贫攻坚这件大事受到了包括美国学者罗伯特·库恩在内的众多西方人士的关注。I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn. I've been following China's changes and challenges for 30 years. I interview Chinese leaders and officials, while I myself am interviewed by Western media. It's as if inhabiting parallel worlds. Robert Kuhn, born in New York City, a scientist, investor, investor, and investor. In 2017, Kuhn traveled to the poorest parts of China, first visiting Guizhou, Gansu, Xinjiang, Shanxi, Sichuan, Hainan, and others. 探访中国贫困家庭，并制作了纪录片《前线之声：中国脱贫攻坚》。经过嵌入式的考察和拍摄，库恩说：“中国的精准扶贫是一个能消除偏见并改变西方民众对中国认知的强有力的故事。”二零一八年十二月十八日，在庆祝改革开放四十周年大会上。库恩因多年来致力于向世界讲述全面真实的中国故事，获颁中国改革友谊奖章。Hello, Dr. Kuhn. Thank you very much to come on our show. It's great to have you,、uh, Dr. Kuhn. You are a seasoned expert on China, and you have been telling China stories to the world in various different forms for more than 30 years. And you visited more than a hundred cities, as well as countless counties, towns, villages. Together, I understand in 2017 you made a documentary about China's targeted poverty alleviation, which is called "Voices from the Frontline: China's War on Poverty," which was very well received internationally, winning some awards. Now, what prompted your long-term commitment to telling the story of China's poverty alleviation to the outside world? My long-term commitment was to tell China stories to the outside world, to present the the real China, the true China, as I was seeing it, as I was experiencing it,、uh, with all its richness, complexity, challenges, problems, obstacles,、uh, as, as best as best I could. Because of my background, I focused more on、um, so, the science and technology,、uh, elite politics, culture. And so I wish I could take the credit for my great commitment to the poverty alleviation campaign,、uh, President Xi Jinping's real vision of, of、uh, precision poverty alleviation. But I cannot.、Uh, it was not my original idea. I was asked to take a look at that because it was so important four or five years before the end of the program. And as I got into it, I realized that this was a world. That was radically different from what I was experiencing in China. As much as I thought I knew China for、um, then, you know, 25 years,、uh, I really did not understand the real China. 
until I focused on poverty alleviation. Not only the the disparities and how people were living in China, uh, but also how the system works. And so I got the very best understanding of how the Chinese governance system works, which was beyond the, the, the remit of poverty alleviation. Poverty alleviation of its own is extremely important. But in digging into it, I really saw how the system worked from top to bottom. And that was the great education. So I was privileged to, to be able to learn and understand about the system as well as about poverty alleviation. And it has greatly enriched my understanding. And I hope we've been able to communicate some of that to, uh, to, to foreigners. Great. Now, please tell us um, when you interviewed these poverty-stricken areas in China, uh, there must have been some particular stories that moved you or impressed you. Could you tell us one or two of these? Sure. There are really so many uh, at different levels. To see the people in poverty and how they reacted. We were in one uh, vill village, for example, where they had what they call a democratic meeting where the whole village was there and they were voting into poverty. Some people who needed to qualify and voting out of poverty, someone had sufficient income where they were out of poverty. And the complexity of the dynamics that I saw was, was fascinating because do you want to be in poverty or not be in poverty? Well, to be in poverty sounds like it's it's, it's a, a negative thing. So you, you want to get out of poverty. On the other hand, Po being in poverty has financial advantages. So some people want to be in poverty, some people want to be out. There were different reasons for it. But to see the dynamic of how it worked, how the people themselves were making the decision who was in poverty and who was out was very impressive. But I'd say the th what I was most impressed with was, was going to remote mountain villages and seeing the young cadre uh, in, in most cases who lived, lived, lived in the village uh, was a male, maybe late 20s, early 30s, and there were several that I spent days with. And this is an individual who came from the provincial capital, was sort of in the system at low to medium level, coming up in the system. And suddenly that person was now spending time in this remote village, living on concrete floors, barely had a bed, a kerosene stove, uh, and dedicated to the people in that area. And I spent time with several of them uh, uh, going literally on their motorcycle to different of the poor, poor people, uh, widows who were living by themselves. Uh, some people didn't want to take advantage and move to cities. And, and so they weren't forced. So this individual would visit them and work with them. I was so impressed with his dedication because I, I thought initially, well, he'll be there for two maybe a few weeks and then visit. But no, he had to commit two years, two years where he was in that village um, uh, all the time. Maybe once a month he could go back and see his family and young young child uh, for, for a weekend. But there was that level of dedication. Now, here's the second part of the story, which was which was very revelatory to me. And I was so impressed. The next day I had lunch with the county party secretary because that was part of our our show. We wanted to show the, the five levels of local party secretaries, each of whom were involved in a process. So the provincial level, municipal level, county level, township. So now I was meeting the county head who, um, it, when you know the system, many of the, the implementations of the anti-poverty program were actually done at the, at the county level. So this is the most, arguably the most important of the five levels who was happening. We were having lunch. And he asked me, you know, what I did. And I mentioned to him that I was really impressed yesterday because I met this cadre, uh, this young fellow who's sacrificing, who's there. And I, I described our day. And then he said something that was really amazing to me. He said, you know what I'm going to do? He said, I'm going to cancel my schedule for tomorrow. And I, I'm going to go to that village and meet that fellow because I want to understand what he does, how he thinks, and then we can take that best practices. So, so that process, I mean, certainly the people impressed me that I was working with who were in poverty or getting out of poverty, who were, had relocated to the remote mountain village to urban areas, the difficulties they had, many stories I could tell there. But what really impressed me was, the lo was this local cadre and then his, bi his big, big boss, who was so impressed with the idea that he was good, that he was going to change his schedule to see him. So it was a great experience for me. I, I, I learned a great deal. 
Now, Dr. Quinn, you once mentioned one of the things you wanted your documentary to do was to undermine the stereotypes of China. Now, what difficulties did your documentary encounter in the process of its creation and publication? Uh, I understand it premiered on PBS in 2019, but it was dropped by it only three days after it was rebroadcast in 2020. Uh, this was not the first documentary I had done. I had three uh, five-hour documentaries over a 10-year period. And the previous three major documentaries were all aired on PBS. And uh, if there were complaints or concerns about it, I never heard any of them. It was all very positive. We had something like 4,500 broadcasts of all that thing over those years. When the poverty documentary was done, uh, it is obviously at a different time because as everyone knows, uh, 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 tragically, the attitudes of the American people towards China and the attitudes to, in parallel of the Chinese people towards uh, the US has plummeted to all time low levels which to me is a great tragedy. So this was a different environment in which uh, I was now showing a documentary on poverty alleviation. The best um, answer that I can give to people who say anything about it is, is watch the documentary. And virtually everyone who has watched it recognizes that what we did it was really unique. You don't have to agree with the system. You don't have to like the system. You don't have to want to adapt the system. Uh, but you understand the system. So I think it was a great and is a great contribution to uh, foreign understanding in general, American in, in particular, about how not just poverty alleviation, but how the system works in, in, in general. 2021年2月25日上午,全國脫貧攻堅總結表彰大會在北京人民大會堂隆重舉行。習近平總書記莊嚴宣告,在中國現行標準下, 9,892个贫困县全部摘帽 世界银行在中国系统性国别诊断报告中称赞中国在经济快速增长和减少贫困方面取得了史无前例的成就。联合国秘书长古特雷斯更是评价道：“中国是过去十年中为全球减贫做出最大贡献的国家。” 2 Kun, under the leadership of the Communist Party of China, China has achieved a complete eradication of extreme poverty. What do you think is the biggest reason for this success? And why do you think China's fight against poverty has attracted the attention of the international community? Let's divide the question uh, into two parts. One is what generated its success, and the second part is what kind of lessons can be learned, particularly in the developing world uh, from uh, China's poverty alleviation. Uh, on the first part, it is clearly the uh, commitment of the party and its leader, uh, General Secretary uh, Xi Jinping, uh, General Secretary of the Party Central Committee, whose vision put that forward. Um, you see that commitment of all the le levels of people in government to make it happen. So I visited with the party secretaries in all five levels, the person in charge in a particular province of each of those levels at the prov provincial level, the municipal level, county level, uh, uh, township and village. And to everyone in that process, it, 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 it was their most important job. It had um, a, a commitment from the very top. President Xi Jinping has said that um, I spend more time on poverty alleviation than on anything else. Uh, and I insisted that that phrase be in the documentary. And so that is a natural transition to the second part, which is what can the international community, particularly developing countries learn from it because it's a complicated story every country is different certainly size but the number one uh, takeaway that countries should have is that 
the program is not going to work unless the number one leader it makes it his priority and everybody knows that chinese experience is is a very important one for the world to understand but you can't copy and paste uh, you have to analyze what the principles are and and how it works the effectiveness of china's system is responsible for the effectiveness of of the program there's no doubt about that no matter what your views of uh, of of the cpc is that is a fact库恩与中国的缘分始于上世纪八十年代末。一九八九年一月，已经是美国知名神经科学家和投资银行家的库恩，首次受邀来华指导科研机构融入市场经济的相关事宜。库恩坦言，那个时候的他对中国了解甚少，但自从来到改革开放初见成效的中国，他就意识到。中国的发展将会对整个世界产生十分重要的影响。在此后的三十年间，库恩多次往返于美中两国，亲眼目睹并经历了当代中国发展的许多重要时刻。Dr. Kun, you are known as somebody who truly understands China. Um, tell us about some of the specific things in China over the past few decades. Uh, other than poverty alleviation, that really impressed you. It's been a uh, a wonderful learning experience to uh, to have the opportunity to to witness firsthand uh, the changes in China. Uh, I first came to China in, in January of 1989, and I was invited by at that time the State Science and Technology Commission. So I began working with China through its science, um, the science side. I've been asked, you know, what's the greatest thing you've seen in China? And the obvious answer is the growth of the economy. So I like to be a contrarian and say the growth of the economy is the second most important thing. And so, what's the most important thing? The most important thing is the changing spirit of the people, the confidence of of, of making the achievements, and then the recognition of、uh, of what the future is. The, the last few years, because of various international tensions, has been. Has been、uh, troubling to me,、uh, but the attitudes and the the vision and and the、uh, the excitement of the Chinese people has been what I have、uh, kind of resonated with and and appreciate. And that's that has been the reason I think that I was drawn to China because of the making so many friends and seeing so many people, real people in in this environment. So I had that kind of experience. And it was really not until the poverty alleviation campaign, where I spent, you know, many years focusing on poverty alleviation, that I really began to see the the whole the whole story of China. And how do you view the 100-year history of the Communist Party of China, leading the Chinese people to achieve rejuvenation? So、uh, the transformation of China, I call it the largest population on earth undergoing the greatest transformation in history, and, and that. Has been led by the Communist Party of China. All the benefits that the party leadership has given are incredibly obvious: poverty alleviation being close to the top of the list, and the vast improvement in the lives of the Chinese people is a case that historians a thousand years from now would be looking at、uh, to study because it's so significant. But the party has a higher obligation. To do certain things for its citizens in terms of reform, transparency, involving the people in the process of governance, what we call whole process people's democracy—that's a whole other subject、uh, that China is focusing on. President Xi has put forth six aspirational adjectives for what the great rejuvenation of China will be by roughly mid-century, and, and those are、uh, prosperous as number one, strong, and number two. Number three is democratic. And then culturally advanced, harmonious, and beautiful. And you mentioned、uh, the process of democracy in China. You once said in your book,、uh, Dr. Kuhn, observing the development of democracy in China is fascinating, even、uh, astonishing. 
What do you think uh, are the differences and similarities between China's whole process people's democracy, which you just mentioned, and Western democracy? Well, the obvious difference is that Western democracy is defined in a more limited fashion because we see the, the patina of democracy many places in the world where there are votes and everybody uh, on the planet knows those are phony, that those are, those are uh, uh, manipulated or misreported or coerced. Uh, everybody knows that. So it's not a simple statement to say that you have to have that, that means democracy, because those are, those are shams. We have an example of that, in my opinion, in, in Ukraine right now, um, a, a so-called referendum. To say the Western system you know, works everywhere is obviously false. I mean, we can, I don't want to name countries, but there are many countries would take more than both of my hands to list them where they have elections which are, shall we say, sus significantly su suspect. Now, when I just start to describe what China's democracy is, I start with the fact that of China's six aspirational adjectives for, what, for where it wants to, to be at its, at its full modernized social society, one of those is democratic. So to begin, China is saying that to have a, a society that can be labeled democratic is our aspirational goal. So that's the first step. And China has been very inventive in coming up with real ways in which democracy can be worked. Democracy being defined as the people being involved in the process of governance. This has been expressed in many different forms. The obvious forms are when laws are, are proposed by the National People's Congress or by local, local congresses. Uh, they are exposed and they are ahead of time announced and people can have all sorts of feedback on those on those laws. And they're taken seriously. Senior leadership, particularly under President Xi, is making officials uh, uh, accountable uh, to the people and making the People's Congresses responsible for bringing public opinion.当的十八大以来now, since the beginning of this year, uh, we see inflation, food and energy crisis are making headlines in different parts of the world. Uh, the world economy isn't doing great. Against this backdrop, how do you view the performance of the Chinese economy and how does the Chinese economy now contribute to the world economy? Well, the first way Chinese economy contributes to the world is being a very large part of it. Uh, going up from barely 1% to, I think the last was 18% of, of the entire world. Uh, in fact, in the last 10 years, if I got it right, it has gone up from 11.4%, 11 maybe in 2012, to eight, more than 18% today. So it's a, it's a large slug. In the past, the growth of the world was very dependent upon China. Uh, 30, 40, 50% of the growth of the entire world was coming from China. China is committed to uh, engage with the world and continue to, to reform and open up. How that's expressed is perhaps a little more complicated now than it was, but there is absolutely no doubt that China is a major part of what is happening in the world today certainly in the world economy. Perhaps I, I would just put a little bit more emphasis on China's relationship with the so-called global south, the developing countries in the world, the developing countries in uh, the Middle East and uh, parts of Asia. China has really focused on, particularly in Africa. Uh, this is a major contribution and we have to recognize that. And so there are these greater challenges that China has in the world today than, than before. But what you cannot gainsay 
is the importance that China plays in every matter of importance in the world. That's why I feel an obligation to do my best to, to explain the real China to the world because of the importance uh, of China to the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuna. That's uh, all of my questions, and that wraps up for today's interview. And thank you for joining us again. A pleasure.